Gentlemen, it's good to have you here again. Um, and uh, we have a great speaker this week. His name is Randy Mortensen. I've known Randy four or five years. He's a great follower of the fuel. He's been very loyal to come and he's spoken before. And um, good to have him again. He's got several irons in the fire. One of them, and I get emails frequently from Worldwide Village, it's a Haitian ministry. Uh, that has been going on a long time is to help make Haitians self-sustaining you know, their own businesses and all. He is also a coach uh, and it works for, for people who uh, may have some substance issues. So any, anyway, y'all welcome Randy. Well, it's a bit of a tough act to follow after Mr. Chris knocked it out of the park last week. Sure. <laughs> and we were having a few technical challenges, but I think we have them all figured out. So we'll, we'll, we'll jump in with this. I don't know about you, but I'm just deeply concerned about the breakdown of American families. Who else in here is concerned about it? Before we leave here today, I promise you, that we're going to discuss some doable ways to move forward. But first, I'd probably be remiss if I didn't give you a little bit of background, or I might say color, on who's Randy. And we're going to talk a bit about my childhood or about my youth here in, in a few minutes. But what I want to share is my recovery journey. And I started to drink. The dirty little secret is I started drinking when I was 13. And I snuck a beer. We were playing pool at a buddy's house, and I snuck a beer out of that bar refrigerator of the parents, and, and I chugged it down. I don't know what it tasted like. I don't know if I liked the taste or anything. But what really got me going was I didn't get caught. It was the exhilaration in not being caught that really caused me to want to do it again and again and again. And then there's another, there's another aspect of my life that had a major impact on it, on me, and who I am today. It was back in, in the late 80s, and, and at that time I was living in, in Iowa. And my wife and I, with our kids, uh, were, at the, were at the beach. Yes, I know it's not an ocean <laughs> beach. It's a river beach, okay? So we, so we were at the beach, and all of a sudden my five-year-old son named Jay just starts vomiting green stuff out. And, and he just doubled over in excruciating pain and he said, Dad, 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 help me. And there was nothing I could do about it other than we rushed him to the emergency room in the hospital. And, and my wife at that time actually worked at that hospital. And they did the, the diagnosis and said, okay, his electrolytes are low, we need to prepare him to do an emergency appendectomy. Well, here we were in beach clothes, you know, not exactly a proper attire for a hospital. So I said to one of the RNs that was in the room, I said, would it be okay if I run home? You know, we're in Sioux City, Iowa, 100,000 people. It, can I run home and, and get some clothes for us to change in? Oh, yeah, no problem. We have at least an hour of prep and, and so on because the le his electrolytes were low. And as I pulled into our driveway, the neighbor lady, our friend, came running over and she said, you have to get back to the hospital right now. And I said, why? I don't know, but, but your wife just called and said, you have to get back to the hospital. So I probably drove a little bit too fast getting back to the hospital because I knew it wasn't because they missed me. There was something that probably wasn't right. And as I go walking into the, to the glass doors, my wife came running at me and she said, Jay's dead. And I said, what? His electrolytes were out of balance. The ER physician did the math wrong on the bed sheet. The ER physician had worked 36 hours straight without sleep. His potassium was low. So instead of giving him two milli equivalents of potassium, he gave him 20. For anybody who knows, potassium was what veterinarians used to put animals down. Two of the ER RNs refused to do it, and the doctor said, here, I'll do it myself. 
pushed the potassium and immediately sent my beautiful five-year-old son into cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. And we didn't ever prove it, but there was a lot of evidence to say that doctor was high on crack. So what I say is when, when I'm speaking to on a different topic, I say, my poor choices as my drinking accelerated over, over, you know, out of my teen years, into my college years, into my 20s and 30s, my poor choices cost me relationships and hundreds of thousands, probably millions of dollars. But the poor choices of that doctor cost me my son. And I don't ever want another dad to go through that. Anyone who's lost a child knows. You know, I lost a dad at an early age. My dad was only 45. That was 12 years before losing my five-year-old son. So the topic I'm going to talk to you about today is restoring families and raising children properly. I do have a 32-year-old son today. So you'll hear a little bit more about Joel, Joel here in a minute. But that loss of that son sent me off into a tailspin. And like I said, I'm not here to share my testimony today, but I need to give you that color for you to, to fully grip why I'm as passionate as I am about restoring families in, in this great country. So let's start with, with Proverbs 22, six. Where is, it's on the screen and, and direct your children where? Onto the right path. And when they're older, they will not leave it. So let me open with a per word of prayer. Father, we're just in awe of your goodness and the grace and the blessings in our lives, Father. And we're just uh, grateful for the opportunity to come together as brothers in your name, Lord, and, and just to, to learn more today about what you would say to us as, as dads. You being our Heavenly Father, God, you are the expert, you are the authority, you are the one that we run to in our times of uncertainty and our times of need. And God, it's just a blessing to be here with the men of fuel to, to just share a few words of encouragement and, and, and so we can just restore whatever hope is missing. God, I just pray that you will move in a powerful way in this room today and that each of us will leave change. Thank you, Jesus, for the life that you gave, that we would have the promise of, of life and eternity with you. Amen. Amen. So I mentioned earlier that in my growing up years, we lived in southwestern Minnesota, rural Minnesota. And when I was in kindergarten, we actually moved into a, a small town called Pipestone. Even though we lived in that small town, we had a lot of hawks. I mean, a lot of pigs, a lot. And guess what my Saturday job was? Cleaning the pig house, cleaning the hog house, shoveling a lot of manure. <laughs> The life lesson that I learned at that time was what? Don't bite your fingernails. <laughs> it's disgusting, even if you wear gloves. So I was very involved in Little League Baseball, played high school sports, actually went on to play baseball in college. And, and when I was 10 or 11 years old, I don't remember exactly, I had a dream to be a business person, just like my dad. Because at that time, he not only owned a farm, but he was also the owner of a plumbing and heating business, later became a large mechanical con contractor. And in spite of being part of a really, really busy family, I secured my first paper out in sixth grade. And I delivered daily papers to around 20 households at that time. It was the Minneapolis Star uh, at that time, or Minneapolis Tribune. I actually don't remember, but it was before the two merged. I do know that. And I would deliver papers to the houses seven days a week. And then I would have to do the collecting. How many had a paper out where you actually had to collect the money? Okay. Well, I want to I want to go on record as saying Walt still owes me eleven dollars and forty cents. <laughs> okay, he owned the Sears store. And and he skipped town without paying me my eleven dollars and forty cents. Who does that to an 11 year old, right? And my, my earnings were all based on net proceeds and, and my dad was absolutely the greatest motivator of, of my business ap, uh, aspirations. He agreed to match all monies that I would deposit into a savings account one to one, dad would. He would say, I'll put whatever you put into savings, I will match it one to one. His only condition was 
I wasn't able to withdraw anything beyond my own contributions. His money always had to stay, and, and this is in the old days, where they actually hand wrote the balances in there at that <laughs> time, or they put them into the fancy machine. Mm -hmm. Well, apparently, paper, one paper route wasn't enough for me, because, because the local paper was delivered twice a week, and, and what did I hear? I heard two streets over, that paper route was now available. So I thought, well, if I can do one, why? I should have, I should have, you know, a two day a week. This other one's seven, but I can do two days a week. And in those routes, there was 120, 110 to 120 papers that I had to deliver, mm -hmm. and they were all printed at this old, this old printing press downtown Pipestone, and and you know, in a moment of insanity, a third paper route came available. If you can do two, why not do three, was my thought. Why neither one of my parents at that time said no is just mind boggling to me. But I now know that my dad and mom both thought I was nuts. But they didn't want to tell me no. My dad was always an encourager. He, he, would, he, he would say he valued me for being an overachiever. And he was busy, he wasn't really available to help. Like I said, when those printing presses broke down, we were supposed to get the papers at five. Sometimes we wouldn't get the papers till eight or nine o'clock at night on school nights. Okay, Mondays and Wednesdays was delivery time. But guess who was always there to help me? My mom. My mom was, was always there. She would put those 100 plus newspapers in her car and she'd drive me up and down the neighboring streets and. And she would even get out of the car herself sometimes and, and take the papers and you had to open the front door and put the papers in between the, the, the screen door and, and the, the main door. She would do that and, and then she would say to me, oh honey, oh honey, don't run so much. You're gonna be exhausted. And I wanted to say to her, really mom? I'm 12 years old. I can pretty much do anything that I want to do without, without having to worry about getting tired. But my mom was always there for me. And I knew day in, day out, that, that mom loved me unconditionally. And I would, I would hope that all moms had the ability to express that to their kids. So what you saw at the beginning and what you see on your, on your handouts is a program called the 10 Greatest Gifts Project. And this project was started by Stephen Vinoy, who's, who's out in, in Denver. And this book came out a few years ago and has become a New York Times bestseller. And Steve, Steve has a powerful journey and, and what he says in here, he talks about the 10 gifts of qualities and values and honesty and responsibility and, and self-reliance that we all wanna give our kids and our grandkids. And then he talks about character and emotional health and, and strong families. And these are the kinds of gifts that none of us can buy in a store, right? These are the kinds of gifts that are priceless. And I'm not going to talk about all five of the, of the gifts today. I'm only going to talk about message. But it's really these five tools that, are, that were the reason why when Steve called me, and I'll share a little bit more about that in a minute, when Steve called me and says, hey, Randy, I want you to be part of my team. And I said, really? I have a hard time saying no, but the passion that he has and, and the, the more that, that I'll share with you in, here in a minute, it, it just, it, I couldn't say no to him. My mom and dad were masters at these tools. When you look at the five tools, my mom and dad were masters. My dad was probably a little better than mom because he was a master at challenging and then affirming me. I never remember my dad saying one negative thing about me. Now, I may have blocked it, but my dad was, was the ultimate encourager. Mom was too, but she was a little bit more codependent. Right? She would believe everything I would say. My dad was a little more astute on, on that. But my mom, like I shared with the paper up, she would help me, me no matter what. She was, she was fortunate to be a stay-at-home mom, but my mom and dad believed in me and their love was unconditional, is what I like to say. So the first tool is really the message tool. And, and it's all about love. And think about, guys, think about 
some of the love messages that you received as a child. Take a minute and think about love messages you received as a child. It could have been from a parent or a grandparent or a teacher or a neighbor or just somebody. It could have been a grin or a hug or a note of encouragement. It could have been anything that helped you to believe in yourself and it helped you to get better. And it built your self-esteem. Okay, so think about that question for a minute. What is one thing that immediately came to mind? I'd love to hear from one or two of you. What, what immediately came to mind? Can't have silence. Or who came to mind as always being the affirming person? Okay, I'm going to pick on you and embarrass you. Yeah. My father was an affirming person. Uh, one of the things he told me uh, later in my life <coughs> was when I was a child growing up and, and he'd be doing something and I wanted to go I say, I'd like to help. And dad was always okay. He'd come help. Always understanding in his own mind now it was going to take twice as long <laughs> to do the job. Right on, right on. Somebody else had their hand up. Yeah. My, my mom would be there. She was always running interference between. Uh, at times, my dad would be a little abusive. And she was, she was the interference person to try to keep us out of trouble. Okay. Anybody else feel a burning desire? My wife. Your wife? Which I lost in January. Okay. She was very affirming. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Well, my mom today is 87 years old and still lives up in the land of the frozen chosen, otherwise known as Minnesota. Um, she's always there for me, always has been. I'm the oldest of three. I have a younger brother and a younger sister. Mom's just always been there for us kids, and she's a great cook. She's persevered through adversity. She was a widow at 41 with a son graduating from high school, my brother, two weeks after my dad died. And so she's, she's just been the person that in the midst of adversity, you never question her love for us. And she's battled through it. She would do anything for her, for her grandkids, her great grandkids today. Her love message, I will say time and time again, made me a stronger man particularly after getting sober, where I had a better understanding of, of what that really meant. Mom was always overflowing with love. I mentioned the, the founder of this, of this program, the author of the book. He called me earlier this year, and, and I said to him, I said, okay, first of all, how did you get a hold of me while well, I was referred to you? I said, why are you calling? Because I heard that, that you're a passionate business guy that's done a lot of ministry and, and so on. I said, so? <laughs> Why are you talking to me? He said, because I think, I think you're one of the strong advocates that we need in our first groups to really help us tell the message. And I, I tell them, I said, I'm not looking for one more thing to do. I'm not looking for a job. And the more I listen to his heart and his passion, and I'm going to share a little bit with, about that today, it was kind of like, why wouldn't I do this? You know, I don't think it's a coincidence that, that God introduced me to Steve through a friend of a friend. And the biggest concern, and I've shared a little bit of this already, is, is we're, we should all be deeply concerned about the breakdown of families in this great country. And what's the cost? It's huge. When I, when I speak on the substance use disorder issue, it's an $800 billion a year cost to our economy. And that's not taking into consideration the broken families, but there is some research and and common sense that directly connects the breakdown of the families to our increased divorce rates, to our poor school performance, to dropouts, to crime, to our prisons being overcrowded, and, and the increase in social services. I will say this, that I will also say that the church has abdicated much of the responsibility that God gave us to the government. And I think this, this COVID thing has allowed the church to be the church in new ways, and, and, and I just love how, how people are coming up and taking care of those who are hungry and those who are homeless and those who are struggling. So the Conservative Partnership Institute did, did research on, on this whole issue of brokenness in families, and, and it said this, if a young person graduates high school and gets married before they start a family, they only have a 5% chance of going into poverty. On the other hand, if a person does not graduate high school and has a child out of wedlock, 
they have over a 40% chance of going into poverty or becoming homeless. Shocking. Thus, our giant concern as this nonprofit is the breakdown of our American families. So the 10 Greatest Gifts Project is a nonprofit. It was started in 2018 in, in Colorado. The goal is to deeply impact 50 million families over the next 20 years and 100 million families over the next 30 years. So why? It's because the research and common sense demonstrates that if we build strong families and children, the core qualities that I mentioned earlier are, are all going to come through and they're going to be passed along from generation to generation. We know that the, the number one thing we can do is build a better world by building more resilient families. It's imperative. And I would, I would even say that it's crazy expensive to try to fix the problem later when, when we're having overcrowded prisons and when we have you know, drug and alcohol abuse at, at unprecedented growth in numbers, it's far easier and less expensive for us to solve it at the grassroots level, at the foundational level. And that's why I got involved. And the, the presentation is typically a two and a half hour presentation where it goes through all of the tools. You can do it either in one setting or you can do it in individual meetings is, is the model. We're now training two groups of presenters uh, every, every month to, to actually get this together. I was in group four, we're now in group nine. So this is still, this is still pretty new, but why I wanted to share it is there might be somebody here that says, hey, I want to be part of this. I want to be a presenter, I want to be a volunteer, I want to help tell the, tell the story because the strategy is really, I've spoken to more rotary clubs in 2020 than I have in a pre previous five years combined because of the virtual nature of, of the rotary meetings. So it's the rotaries, the Kiwana, is the, you know, the, those, those social clubs, that's not the right name, but you know what I mean. Um, or churches, we have a couple of partnerships with, with synods, so we can go into a church and we can weave the faith-based element in, into, into this also because it's absolutely a part of it. Large conferences, the mission really is, is, is we're just looking for others who are deeply concerned about the breakdown of American families to come alongside. And we're looking for people that want to say, hey, we're stepping up to, to do something. We're looking for long-term partnerships, but we don't need to sign any formal, fancy agreements. We can, we can just start with baby steps, and it's information sessions like this. And there's a variety of partnership programs. Our goal here in Brevard is to launch, and then we already have a person down in Delray Beach, and then we're going to take it across Florida. And, and there's one of the largest denominations that I won't say who out loud, but they have an office over here on one, and they might have Southern Baptists in their name. Um, we're looking at aligning with their districts, with all 67 of their districts already. I've been speaking to them to really get some traction. But we're, we, I, what, I, what I say often is I can guarantee you that with our partners and, and our nonprofit, we can do more to build strong, resilient families than all the politicians in Washington, D.C. combined. Can I get an amen? <laughs> so our dream and the mission is clear. We want to build priceless qualities and values, those like honesty, responsibility, self-reliance, and, and thereby we come up with healthy, joyful, and close-knit families. And that's how we're going to change the world. Bill mentioned Haiti. I'm taking the same program to Haiti, okay? Now, I'm not good enough in Creole to do it myself, but I'm gonna train somebody that, that is good enough because we wanna partner with people to create the family of their dreams. That's our goal. And the five tools that I mentioned earlier aren't anything new. When you look at these five tools, we've all been using them. What I will say, though, is what I've learned is there's the old way and there's the new way. Let me give you a couple of examples as, as I go through this. Because the old kind of message is called a hurt message, where, where you're telling somebody to do something. And it doesn't make you feel valuable. It slows you down. And I'll give you an example here in a minute. As I reflect back on being the dad of, of, of a young son, 
his room was always a mess. His room was horrible. And then the bathroom was adjacent to Joel's room. And that was the bathroom that if we had company, that was the bathroom company used, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the public restroom. <laughs> well, Joel's room was a mess. The bathroom was worse. Mm -hmm. and, and so I would say to him, okay, Joel, it's one thing for your bedroom to be complete chaos, but you have to clean the bathroom and keep it clean. Otherwise, people coming to visit are going to think we're horrible parents, is what I would say to him. And I'd say, you look like a total slob. I would say that, guys. And what's the message I just gave him? You're worthless. Right? You're not important. And I can still remember the hurt that I saw in his eyes. And his, and his lip would turn turn up. And he was sad. He was brokenhearted. He, he would begin to cry. And then he would just slam his door in anger. How can I blame you? Right? I, that's the old way. So the classic situation that describes both the hurt message, or the, the way to hurt using the love message, as well as a way to use the love message in a positive way is, is like this. Like I said, I used to have issues with Joel's messy room. Anybody ever have kids with messy rooms? <laughs> How about, you were a kid with a messy room. Yeah, I didn't. My mother made my bed every day of my life. How's that okay? Right? But Joel wasn't born with the message in his brain that, yeah, I'm going to be a messy little pig. That's not how he was born. But the thing that I was trying to do to get him to create a clean room and be a responsible child was having absolutely the opposite of that. And so, so as I look back, as a parent, we're either going to amplify in our sons and daughters the positives, or we're going to amplify the negatives, aren't we? Based on what we say and how we, how we respond. Joel wasn't intentionally creating a mess in the bathroom, but my derogatory comments were, were just doing anything but encouraging him to, to change. So the, that's the hurt message approach. Another way that I would say, would behave, is I'd say to him, when I'd come home, I'd say, your room and your bathroom's a mess. That doesn't sound horrible, does it? I, I would just say it. It's kind of my job. And and yet, I was saying, you're messy. You're not responsible. Or, even worse, I'd come home and look in his room when he was sitting in there, and I'd just walk away. I wouldn't say a word. You know my face wasn't exactly happy, positive, smiling. Because I was teaching him that he was irresponsible, messy, and a bad person. I look back now, I am so sad by the verbal abuse that I lobbied on to him. There was no question. And I, was, and I was sober, guys, when I was doing this. So I can't even blame it on my alcoholism. So here's an important question. Once we realize what we're doing, how can we turn that around and turn it into a positive instead? We need to commend them for the positive acts or for the good things that they're doing. And sometimes it's tough to find one with kids, particularly teenagers, I would say. But we, we, need, we need to find positives but they have to be sincere because if we act like their room is clean and it's not, then they don't trust us. What else? If, you, if, you, if you're not smart enough to figure out my room's not clean, then what else is it that you're saying that, that I shouldn't be buying into? And so what I would do as <laughs> after talking to another buddy, I would say, Joel, good job. You were really, you were really being a good friend to, your, to, to Jake. Or I would say, Joel, good job. You got your assignment done early. It's those sorts of affirmations. And then, and then what blew me away one time was Joel actually picked his plate up off the table and took it to the sink himself. Okay? First of all, I wondered what he was going to ask me for. Right? But I affirmed him. I said, Joel, great job. Thank you for helping. Guess what? Next day, he took two plates. That's how simple it is for us to go away from the old hurt messages 
and go to the messages of affirmation. That's what the messaging is all about. If you're not already masters at using love messages, let's grow together, guys. That's my mission, is, is to grow together. So let's take a look at another scripture that does talk about us and parenting. This was, this was really God's guidance to the Israelites uh, at, at, at the time, and they were told to love God with all their heart, soul, and strength. And Jesus then said what? This is the most important commandment in the Bible. That's what Jesus said. Loving God entails the decision to follow God's program. Looking to him constantly for help and forgiveness is what those words are. Looking to him constantly. Because when does our life get better? Mine got better 18 months after getting sober. Mine got better in March of 1992 when I gave my heart to the Lord. I didn't know what I didn't know, even though I sat in a church every Sunday of my life. But it wasn't until that Sunday morning when I truly understood what it was to be to be a fully devoted follower of Christ and gave my heart to the Lord. Has that had an impact on me being a dad? Absolutely, it has. Here's something else as, as I get ready to close. Is Pastor Rick Warren made this quote. Too often in the United States we get caught up in what? Our success. Rick Warren said this you make a living by what you get you leave a legacy by what you give Amen. what caused me to walk away from the corporate world was I read a book called From Success to Significance I was a VP of a 50 billion dollar gas and electric utility in Minneapolis read the book at 51 years of age walked away from one of the most lucrative corporate careers anybody could have ever wanted because I knew there was nothing in my life that I was doing that was making an impact. If you would have told me 16 years ago we'd be doing what we're doing for the last 15 years in Haiti, I would have said you're smoking crack. It was nowhere on my radar screen. And, and yet, God had a different plan. And it's one thing to, to recognize that, but we need to be willing to make the changes and willing to learn new ways to use these, these tools. And then we need to be obedient because, because our families need it, guys. Our spouses need, need us to be the better man. There's no question about it. So here's three questions that I want to leave you with. Remember my story about my dad. He and my mom deeply, deeply influenced my life. And dad would say, son, you're going to be a successful businessman someday. And he would encourage me. Here's my question number one. Who's the positive influencer in your life? Who touched your life in a way that you remember? Second question. <clears throat> who, is, who are you the positive influencer for? The third question. Who are you going to be an even greater positive influence for starting today? And I want to tell you what I left on, on your tables. You will see that, that I am now a podcaster also. Um, my podcast is called Courageous Recovery. It's a weekly uh, podcast that does go out. We actually have listeners in 18 or 19 countries now. And I'm always looking for guests that have a recovery journey uh, on there. I, I also do executive recovery coaching. I do keynotes literally around the world to white collar corporate America. Some of you have enough gray hair to know what I mean when I say white collar corporate America. Mm -hmm. Now it's called talented management professionals that are dealing with drugs and alcohol or other compulsive and destructive behaviors. How many know that the suicide rate amongst pastors today, guys, is at the highest it's been in history? Okay, mm -hmm. there's no, they have nobody safe to go to. Okay, so my, my typical keynote is either to corporate America or it's to faith leaders is my message, okay? And, and then the other, the other sheet that's, that's there is, is, is just for the cohorts that I do, and we'll, we'll have another discussion about that at some point. But I, I hope you found this valuable. If you're interested in, in volunteering or, or learning more about the 10 Greatest Gifts Project, we're looking for more people. Uh, and once again, thank you for your attendance and your participation. Thanks, Bill.
somewhere in normal times between 27 and 30,000 people on a weekend. Quest 180 in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul is now at five of their campuses. So the outreach is huge. So this gives me goosebumps to share that um, I've been praying for the last four or five years that God would open the door in Brevard County. And um, it wasn't happening. And I know why now I didn't have time to do that. But first of the year, we're actually starting Quest 180 at Church of the Air. The second question, have you heard of transactional analysis? No. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so what, what Quest 180 is, I, I've been part of Celebrate Recovery, John Baker and Pastor Rick Warren, who are quoted, I've been in meetings with them. Celebrate Recovery just goes too slow. It takes you 12 months to get through the 12 steps. What we would do is we would get through the 12 steps every 90 days, and they're still doing it up there. And, and so it takes the big book of AA, it takes the Life Recovery Bible and Celebrate Recovery and blends the materials. To, so it's all Bible-based. And then we have a large, the parents group was always our largest group. Parents will come in, oh, you'll never believe what my 16-year-old kid did. Yeah, yeah, we know. <laughs> yeah, it's for sure. But thank you. I didn't even know I had it in there somewhere. But. <coughs> okay, anything else? Dangerous to give me the microphone. <laughs> I don't like to give it back. Oh, no. sure, so. okay. All right. For the next two weeks, we're going to be doing something different. We're going to have a video of Revelation and Chronological Order by Pastor Jim Johnson that we're going to show on screen if we can get all the technology work. Uh, I'll have a backup in place somehow. But, um, it's a great study. I listened to the full one, which is like 26 episodes, an hour long, several times. Uh, this is a little more condensed, and we'll listen to the first one. And if that whets your appetite for more, you can uh, pursue it on your own. But anyway, see you next week. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.